Good afternoon everybody. Today we are going to begin a playthrough of Eric the Unready, which is a 1993 uh, text adventure game by Legend Entertainment. Uh, quite a quirky little game, uh, quite a lot of uh, entertaining humour. I've played it before, although I don't think I've ever completed it. So there will be, uh, hopefully, towards the end of the game, some uh, new and interesting things that I haven't seen before. The only thing I haven't done thus far is actually check the audio levels. So once I start this, it may be necessary to turn the audio up or down, depending upon how loud it is. So um, let me know in chat if it needs adjusting. So, let's get started. And it came to pass that Sir Eric rode out from the castle of King Fudd the Bewildered to do battle with the Knight of the Black Pauldron. Then did our goodly knight gaze upon the face of his opponent, and it befell that he forgot the words of the challenge he must utter in order that the contest might commence. Therefore did Eric consult that most ancient and sacred tome of chivalry, How to Joust. But Sir Eric's visor did smash shut upon his face, and the sacred book did fall unto the ground, and when the knight made once again to raise up his visor, then did the point of his lance become impaled upon the branches above. Gadzooks, quoth Sir Eric, mine lance is stuck. Then came, then came there a deluge of apples which did unhorse the dread foe. Thus did Eric the Unready become victorious over the dreaded knight of the Black Baldra. On the eve of that same day, Duke Theobald the Erratic threw open his feasting hall to celebrate the defeat of that dread knight, who had held the Duke's castle in his thrall. A toast, cried Sir Eric. The guests, sensing impending disaster, fled for their lives. Oops. The following morning, the shop steward of the Knights Union Local 704 confronted Sir Eric. Let me review for you the highlights of your career thus far. While still in night school, you impaled an instructor who was standing next to a dummy during jousting practice. Last month, you, pulled, you burned down Ulrich's house of torches when you left the door open on a windy day. And yesterday, you destroyed the feasting hall of Duke Theobald the Erratic. From now on, you will receive only those quests which I deem suitable for your obvious limited talents. The shop steward glances down at the paper in his hand and says, Here's the perfect thing. This morning, a farmer came into the union hall and said that a passing witch had turned his only daughter into a pig. Your quest today, Sir Eric, is to go to his farm and break the enchantment by kissing the pig. Here is your work slip. I don't want to see your face again until the task is done.
Farmyard. Well, here we are, says the farmer. He opens the gate and brings you into the farmyard. He points to the pig running round in the yard and says, There she is. One good kiss ought to do it. Slowly you approach the pig. She eyes you warily. You bend down to kiss her, but she squeals in terror and bolts into the privy. Seconds later you hear a squishy plop. Now you've done it, complains the farmer. Some hero you are. Well, don't just stand there. Get cracking. So, let's uh, put together our uh, first save. And uh, as the farmer says, get cracking. So, we can go west or northeast. West uh, is the barn. The barn is old but clean. The floor has been swept and everything seems pretty much in its place. The cows are well groomed and they are contentedly chewing on their cuds in a manner vaguely reminiscent of the farmer. Set into one wall is a closed medicine chest, a rope hangs on the wall and the exit to the farmyard lies to the east. Uh, open chest. You open the medicine chest and discover a vial, a bottle and a flask. Vile taken. Your score has just gone up by two. Note, you can activate and deactivate score change notification using the notify command. Bottle taken. Your score has gone up by two. Flask taken. Rope taken. Uh, I should probably examine the items I've taken, shouldn't I? Uh, examine vile. Torties. Testudinal muscle relaxant. Hogwild, porcine aphrodisiac. That's the flask. Examine. Sorry, that's the bottle. Examine flask. Calpitate, bovine binding agent. Hmm. Uh, you are standing in a tired-looking farmyard that is absolute that is in absolutely no danger of finding itself pictured on the cover of Better Homes and Barnyards. An aging barn lies to the west, and to the northeast is a small shack with a crescent moon over the door. A weather-beaten farmer is staring at you impassively, his expression vaguely reminiscent of a cow. The inside of the privy is small, cramped and smelly. It is the requisite graffiti on the wall as well as a few magazines that you hope are intended for reading. The bench is a one holer, and though the hole you can see and through the hole and through that hole you can see a pick happily rolling around in the muck below. There is a hook on the wall, the only way out is the small door to the southwest which leads back out to the farmyard. On the bench you see a newspaper. What happens if I take all? Newspaper taken. Examine newspaper. Now from what I can remember, I think the newspapers in these games are actually in-game items that you can look at which update as the world changes around you. That is to say, new newspapers are published periodically, not these are magical newspapers that change. Uh, the Town Inquirer, Volume 1, 199, Issue 89, A Square Paper for, round, for a Round World, Saturday. Eric duplicates miracle of loaves and fishes. Thousands of pilgrims feast on fruit sent from heaven. Um, next item. Duke Theobald's Castle Burns. The feasting hall of Duke Theobald the Erratic burned to the ground last week during a celebratory luncheon honouring the retirement of the Knight of the Black Pauldron, who had held the castle in his thrall for the past 20 years. It was time for me to move on, said the knight prior to the blaze. I've got a nice piece of land picked out near the inner sea. The people there seem nice and I can terrorise them part time and still have plenty of evenings and weekends free for collecting shells. Fuds last week. According to an ancient prophecy, King Fudd the Bewildered will die this coming Saturday. The Taurus Inquirer's learned that he plans to spend his last week of life closeted in his cha chambers playing with toy soldiers. Personal. Uh, SWF Capulet seeks handsome and daring partner for life. Must have a good bal must have good balcony climbing skills. Send woodcut and resume to Friar Lawrence. 
No Montagues, please. That's obviously a reference to Romeo and Juliet. Help Wanted. Merry Men. Established Outlaw seeks support group. Successful candidates will have experience sleeping in forests as well as hands-on experience in wealth redistribution programs. That's uh, obviously a reference to Robin Hood. For sale. Boy's crutch. Hardly used. Cash only. Contact Ebenezer S. So, um, that's a reference to A Christmas Carol. Career opportunity. In a rut? Tired of the same old drudgery of peasantry? Enroll at the Columbia School of Abacus Training and become an abacus operator. In six short months, you'll be, a, you'll be ready to enter the exciting new world of abacai. Learn the differences between the pineapple and the little blue brands. Master the incompatibilities in bead colours, wire sizes and horizontal versus ver vertical frame orientation. Not affiliated with the Columbian School of Piracy or any other institution. General Interest Holy Grail Tours Don't have time to track down the Grail on your own? Why reinvent the wheel? Join one of our tours. The quest bus leaves daily from Glastonbury Square. Call 1-800-BUSTERS and ask for Shay. I don't know what that's a reference to. I mean, Busters obviously makes one think... Um, Ghostbusters or something, but I, I've never w seen it, so I don't know if there's a Shay. Nor do I understand the connection to the Holy Grail, so I wonder if that's a reference to some some other uh, something else in pop culture. Lost one warship, fully manned. Reward contact W Bly, Pitcairn Island. Fairly certain that's a historical reference, but uh... I can't place it. Captain Bly, was it? Bounty was it? Yes, it was. Okay, that's a reference to the HMS Bounty. Oh, and I think that's it. So that's that newspaper. So I assume we want to tie the rope to the hook. You tie one end of the rope to the hook and throw the other end down into the privy. Uh, then we'll have to climb down. You grab the rope and squeeze yourself down through the narrow hole in the bench. Once through, you slide the rest of the way down the rope and fall into the muck below with a disgusting plop. Up to your knees in it. You're up to your knees in stuff. A rope hanging from above provides the only exit. A startled pig is here, eyeing you warily. Now, I don't think I'm going to enjoy this, but I assume I'm supposed to drink the hog wild to make the uh, pig interested in me so that I can carry the pig back out. And indeed kiss it to um, lift the curse on the farmer's daughter so the pig can transform back into her. You swallow the aphrodisiac and suddenly feel tingly all over. You begin to see the pig in a whole new light. Ah! Okay. I was supposed to give the hog world to the pig and not drink it myself. You begin to see the pig in a whole new light. The pig notices a strange look in your eye and begins to back warily away. You make a sudden dive for the porker, but she eludes your grasp. Several futile chase filled hours later, you collapse of exhaustion and a broken heart. You have failed. Um, undo. Okay, so yeah, I've gone back uh, one move. So I haven't drunk the... Hog wild. Give hog wild to pig. The pig eagerly sucks down the contents of the bottle, which magically vanishes into thin air. A shiver passes through the sow's body, and she suddenly seems much more interested in you than before. Without warning, she makes a leap for your leg, wraps her own stubby legs around it, and hangs on for dear life. Oh dear. Uh, you climb back up the rope, dragging the pig along with you. The inside of the... yeah, we've read that. Uh, south... West. Oops.
Uh, you stumble out of the privy, dragging the pig along with you. I've done it, you announce to the farmer. Here's your pig. If you'll just sign the work slip, then I'll be on my way. The farmer r remains expressionless. You've not done yet, lad, he says. That's still my only daughter, and you've got to kiss her to remove the enchantment. But remember, no tongues. The pig baits her eyelashes, puckers her lips, and wiggles her haunches suggestively. Kiss pig. Slowly your lips approach those of the slime-covered animal. Finally, you close your eyes, take the plunge, and give the pig a resounding smack right on the lips. At that moment, you hear a voice from beyond the gate. Hello, Daddy, I'm back. Did you miss me? I just popped over to Auntie May's to get some apples. She catches sight of your manure-covered figure. Ugh, who's this? The pig drops off your leg and trots over to the girl to investigate her apples. The farmer looks embarrassed for about a tenth of a second and says, Well, well, sorry about that. No harm done, though. Why don't you go into the barn and wash up, and I'll fill out your work slip. Talk to daughter. <laughs> I don't think your father likes me. Oh, don't take it personally. He doesn't like any bumbling idiots. Oh. Would you like to go out with me sometime next month? Sorry, I'll be washing my hair next month. I've got to go now, goodbye. Uh, the barn was west, I believe. You walk into the barn, covered head to toe with muck. To the cows, you look like a monster from Return of the Swamp Thing. They bolt from their stalls and stampede for the door. Uh, knocking out the main strut that holds up the barn. As the barn begins to collapse around your ears, you hear a low rumble and realise from long experience that this is the time to make your exit. Your score has just gone up by 25. While trotting the long miles back to the village, you hear hoof beats behind you. The royal carriage of Princess L'Oreal the Worthy comes over the hill and pulls to a halt beside you. With a goest thou, Sir Knight, calls the princess from within the carriage. To the castle, my lady. Then ride with me in my carriage. But my troth, I cannot, my lady, for I am covered in filth and would befoul the presence of one so fair as yourself. Nonsense, cries the princess. Hop in. You are most kind, my lady, to have pity on a poor knight in my condition. Think nothing of it. You're Eric, aren't you? I've seen you around the village. Yes, my lady, I am that unfortunate he who is barely worthy of the name of knight. Don't be daft. I think you're a perfectly good knight. He's just had a run of bad luck. You keep trying, that's the main thing. If I ever got in trouble, I'd much rather be rescued by you than by one of those stuck-up prima donnas who come preening around the castle. Fear not, my lady, no one would dare harm the daughter of Good King Fudd. To do so would incur the wrath of that flower of chivalry, the Knights of the Rhomboid Table. No one would be so foolish as to take that risk, even for one so beautiful as yourself. Oh, go on. But I hope you're right, for it would break my father's heart if anything happened to me. Well, I see we've arrived at the castle. I have to go see my father, but I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. You awaken to a new day. You are lying on your bed in the castle barracks. You try to get up, but discover you can't. 
You recall that you were so tired last night that you tumbled into bed without removing your armour. After your excursion into the privy, that appears to have been a bad move. Now the armour is rusted shut. Barracks on the bed. Uh, these are the Spartan living quarters of those knights who don't earn enough money to have their own castle. Currently, you are the only resident. The only exit is to the east. On the bed, you see a card. Examine card. It's a warranty card from Giovanni's House of Armour that guarantees your armour will be rust free for one year after purchase. There is a sketch of a suit of armour on the card, with your measurements written in alongside it. Come to think of it, the sketch looks a lot like the one that's in your game manual. Uh, take card. You can't move. The armour is rusted. Um, has rusted around you, trapping you inside. Your squire runs in and shouts, Princess L'Oreal, the worthy has been kidnapped. All knights must. He stops in mid-sentence and wrinkles up his nose. Phew! What does that smell? He covers his nose and continues. All knights must report to the Union Hall immediately. He runs out. I think I'm still stuck here. Um, let's try removing the armor. What actions can I do? Yes, remove is an action. Remove armor. Uh, how are they spelling armor? The English way or the American way? The English way. That's interesting. I wonder if Legend Entertainment was a a British company. You can't move. The armor's rusted around you, trapping you inside. Okay, this is a bit of a conundrum. Examine me. Yeah, Eric the Unready, mighty hero. Your squire returns and says, Let's go, Sir Eric. Everyone is waiting. Only then does he notice your predicament. He starts pulling bits of rusted armour off you while breathlessly filling you in on the details. The princess returned from a carriage ride yesterday and she retired immediately to the royal baths, which nobody quite understands because she had already bathed once that day. Anyway, when she finished, she went to bed early. When her handmaidens uh, went to wake her up today, she had disappeared. Now they're going uh, to assign the quest to rescue her, and we're going to miss it unless you get moving. He pulls off the last piece of armour and races out the door. Uh, let's take all quickly. Helmet taken, card taken. And the only exit is to the east. So we're in the barracks right now. And east takes us to the courtyard. This is the courtyard of King Fudd's castle, a towering, pile, a towering pile of towers and turrets that Fudd himself designed with the help of his court wizard. The entrance to the castle lies to the north, and next to it is a tall tower with a strange dish-shaped collection of wires on the top. There is a window high up in the tower, and a garden at the base. The entrance to the barrack lies to the west, and the town itself lies to the south. Uh, you see a newspaper here. Take all. Newspaper taken. Examine newspaper. It's not like we're in any particular hurry, are we? Eric elopes with Pig. I love her and I won't give her up, says the knight. I've been seeing her in secret for over two years and I finally decided to make an honest pig of her. That's not how I remember it. Tornado strikes farm. A tornado touched down yesterday on farmer Berthold, the Cheap's homestead. The barn and several outbuildings were flattened. The farmer, his daughter, and the daughter's apples were all unharmed. The livestock also seemed to be unscathed, although one pig is reported to be very despondent. A <laughs> uh, 121-year-old woman gives birth while hand hang gliding. A 121-year-old woman gave birth to a two-headed baby yesterday while hang gliding in the Rim Mountains. I don't see what the fuss is about, said Gretchen the Old and Wrinkled. All my children have had two heads. I've got them scattered all over Taurus. I don't get that reference. I think it might be to some part of Irish mythology, perhaps? No. Maybe Anglo-Saxon. 
Would that be f to do with the legend of Beowulf? Um, anyway. Personal. Bilbo, come home. All is forgiven. P.S. I sold the ring, Frodo. That's a reference to the Lord of the Rings, obviously. Help wanted. Two guardsmen seeking like-minded group-oriented individual. Must be bold, daring, and willing to sleep free to a bed. Chocolate lover preferred. I don't... I didn't get that reference. For sale. Albatross. Good condition. Cheap. New owner must pick up in person. No delivery terms available. A Mariner. So that's a reference to the poem The Ancient Mariner. For sale. A hundred acres of prime woodland. Some indigenous wildlife. Easily cleared for commercial development. See Robin. Oh, Christopher Robin. That's a reference to um, uh, Winnie the Pooh and the Hundred Acre Wood. General interest. Flabby? Worn out? What you need is exercise. Join the Flour Mill Health Club. Excellent treadmill. Uh, 50 pounds free weights. Convenient 12 hour workout programs. General interest for hire. Archaeological adventurer. Good working relationship with Germans. No stakes, please. Contact I. Jones. That's a Indiana Jones reference. General interest. I said anything. Come to the bazaar. Ask for Shadow's Runt. I don't get that reference. Legal notice. The Puce Pimperell has filed, filed for bankruptcy protection from his creditors. He is working towards a settlement whereby he can reopen shortly under a new colour. <laughs> uh, lost. Small wooden puppet. No strings attached. Trick nose. Contact Geppetto. That's obviously a Pinocchio reference. Trade news. Heard any good gossip recently? Want to pass it along? Give us a call. We guarantee complete anonymity. Cleric's Gossip Weekly has been minist has been mis ministering to the rumor to the rumor needs of the Golden Empire for over a tenth of a century. Call one CGW Rumbags. Ask for Jill Snow. Don't get that reference. And we're done. Uh, right, what were the exits? Uh, if I look, will it remind me? Oh, the Sergeant of, Arms appear, uh, Sergeant of Arms appears out of nowhere and drags you to the Union Hall. Then he takes up a position in the entrance that makes it clear that no one is going to be able to get out until he steps aside. Uh, the Union Hall is a place where all the knights come each morning hoping to be assigned one of the day's quests. It's a tired looking room with a trophy case in one corner and pictures of famous knights lining the walls. Uh, there's old knights here, there's young knights here. I think that's largely it. Uh, talk to old knights. You haven't mentioned how far you walked through the snow to get to school. Oh, it was just 20 miles through the snow. The hard part was that we didn't have any shoes. It was uphill both ways and we had to carry those darn lead weights. Do you think they might assign this quest to me? You? Ha! If they give you this quest, we'll eat our greaves. What is the maximum airspeed velocity of an unladen Garpathian swallow? I think that's a Monty Python reference. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I think. What is the maximum? Uh, don't be daft, lad. The Carpathian swallow can't fly. Have any of you guys ever fought the Stygian dragon? Us, personally? Well, uh, no, not exactly. But we've seen woodcuts and it was definitely a lot more fierce in our day than it is now. Is eating oatmeal really the right thing to do? If it's good enough for Sir Wilfred of Brimley, it's good enough for us. I don't get that reference. Uh, you over the conversation of some fat old knights sitting in the back of the hall. Soft, I call them. Coddled. One good melee, a few severed limbs, and half of them would ru go running home to their mummers. Uh, do you think the shop steward might assign me this quest? Absolutely. And monkeys might fly out of your backside. 
Uh, won't your neck get stuck if you sit too long in that position? Nonsense, I'm a fully trained knight who can withstand more discomfort than this for hours on end. Which one of you guys keeps short sheeting my bed? It is gremlin, Sir Eric. Perhaps you need some demon begone. Have any of you fought the Stygian dragon? Us? Well, uh, current union regulations discourage excessive personal endangerment. I guess I should stop talking now. And look at that fancy equi equipment. In our day, we didn't have lances, we had long sticks that we sharpened with our teeth. And helmets? We used kitchen pots on our heads and hoped for the best. Uh, what else is there to do here? Hibachi? What's that then? Once, long ago, many knights rode out on a great quest. Their holy mission was to recover the most sacred artifact known to man, the vessel used at the Last Supper. After a year and a day, one knight returned from the quest. Mortally wounded, with his dying breath, he asked that the vessel he found be permanently enshrined here in the Union Hall. His will was done, and thanks to his brave deeds, all who enter here are granted the sublime honour of seeing with their own eyes the Holy Grail. And what about those crossbows? In the old days, we all... We... All we had were long poles and bits of string. Half the time, the thing would break in our hands and send the arrow flying into our stomachs, and then we'd die because we didn't have proper medicine. Not like today, with all those fancy leeches and such. In our day, if we needed to bleed, we would ignore a hole in our wrist until we hit an artery. After it drained for a while, we'd tie a rag around it and it real tight, and then wait for the hand to fall off. Oh. Um, examine pictures. Your eyes fall on one of the pictures. Sir Gaspar the Hasty, killed in the line of duty during the quest for the Dragon of Cabbage Patch. He was the first to track the infamous beast to its lair. He had snuck up behind the monster and lifted its tail to strike the killing bow, when without warning the dragon... Um incinerated the brave knight on the spot, not to mention how they run sieges nowadays. Now it would catapult this and battering ram that. In my day, would send 500 screaming maniacs running up the castle wall to form a human pyramid. Then some unlucky individual would climb up to the top while the defenders would pour boiling oil on his head. Then if by some chance he made it, they'd hack him to bits with their swords. But did that stop him? No. He'd run down to the inner gate and use what was left of his body as a counterweight so the rest of us could rush in to kill all the livestock and rape the women. Or was it the other way around? I'm a little fuzzy on that detail. Oh dear. Uh, what else can we do here? There's a sign here. Examine sign. The sign... Uh, proudly declares this to be local 504 of the Knight Union. The room falls silent as a shop steward comes in. He faces the troops with a pained expression on his face and begins to speak. Listen up, man. The King's daughter, Princess L'Oreal the Worthy, has been kidnapped. It's my job to assign one of you knights to the task of going out and rescuing her. The quest is especially tricky because of the impending death of King Fudd. For those of you who aren't up on these matters, I remind you of the ancient prophecy that has foretold that Fudd will die on his 60th birthday, which is this coming Saturday. The prophecy states that the unmarried princess who is at Fudd's side when he expires shall inherit the kingdom. What this means is that if L'Oreal is not returned here by Saturday noon, the crown shall pass to Queen Morgana's daughter by a previous marriage, Griselda the Hefty. All of you know that the traditional reward for the rescue of a kidnapped princess is half the kingdom and the girl's hand in marriage. So, after long and careful consideration of the various talents of all the knights in the realm, I've decided to assign this quest to... Eric the Unready. Uh, 
Eric shouts one night, that incompetent? Why our treasury still hasn't recovered from the cost of rebuilding Ulrich's house of torches? Yes, shouts another, and Farmer Bert, uh, Berthold, the cheap, still hasn't figured out how to get that chicken out of his cow's um, backside. How can you pick Eric? Silence, roars the shop steward. The decision has been made and the decision is final. The knights start to file out of the hall, glaring at you as they pass. A few of the older ones are angrily gnawing at their greaves. Soon you are left alone. Uh, examine case. I don't think we looked at the case. The case is closed up tight and, is, and securely locked. Inside you see something that vaguely re resembles a hibachi. Okay. Uh, west. Let's leave. Village square. This is the village square. The courtyard lies to the north, the union hall to the east, the village green to the south, and the armory to the west. While you're in the union hall, a crowd was gathering in the village square. You elbow your way to the front of the throng and learn that they have come to see Ponce, the most famous bard in all of Taurus. Despite his fame, his prices are reasonable, as evidenced by the sign at his side. Someone tosses the bard a copper penny. He pockets the coin and says, A man walks into a barber surgeon's office. On his head is a bright green frog. The barber surgeon asks, What's the problem? The frog answers, I'd like to have this wart on my backside removed. Hmm. Uh, right. So I left, was it to the west, so the east would take me back to the Union Hall, presumably. Yes. Someone tosses the bard a copper penny. He pockets the coin and says, A knight attending a royal feast lets out a giant belch. The king looks at him and says angry, how dare you belch before the queen? The knight says, I didn't know she wanted to go first. Uh, west is the armory. Okay, we needed to go here. Giovanni's House of Armour is a small pleasant shop that specialises in tailor-made suits of armour. It is run by a small pleasant man named Giovanni. The exit to the street lies to the east. Giovanni looks, looks up at you as you come in and says, Buongiorno, Eric. What's the matter for you? Uh, give helmet to Giovanni. This is to show him the rust. You give Giovanni the helmet, he looks it over. This uh, looks in pretty good shape. You keep it, Eric. He tosses his helmet back to you. Okay, that didn't work. Uh, give card to Giovanni. He, you got. You got a problem? I fix. He rummages behind the counter and says, What was your helmet size again? To learn the correct answer, you can either spend the rest of the day making a series of wild guesses, or you can consult the armor diagram in your game manual. Uh, helmet was 14. What was your Vanbury circumference again? 6. What was your gorget circumference again? 16. Giovanni puts back out from behind the counter and says, Okay, we got it now. Come back next week and I got a brand new suit for you. Until then, wear a dis cloak. It's the finest quality. Last worn by Wizard himself, he tosses you a cloak. Examine cloak. It's a simple cloak that has a single pocket. Examine pocket. You'd have to be wearing the cloak to do that. Wear cloak. You put on the cloak. Examine pocket. Within the pocket you see a packet. Examine packet. That's kind of hard to do while it's in your pocket. <laughs> um, remove packet. You take the packet from the pocket. Examine packet. It's just a small packet that reads rapid grow beans. Just plant it in the ground and add water. Inside the packet you see a single bean. Okay. I remember from playing this game before where that's supposed to be used. Uh, someone tosses about a silver penny. He pockets a coin and launches into a long song about a knight and his chaste love for the wife of the king. North. Courtyard. Why 
happens if I go north again? West is into the barracks, isn't it? I end up in the feasting hall. This is the fabled feasting hall of King Fad. The knights of the rhomboid table are roundly cavorting. The doorway leads up to the queen's chambers, but it is guarded by an alert guard. In the fireplace, you see some kindling. Take all. You ta kindling taken. Your score is increased by five. South. Uh, someone tosses the bard a copper penny. He pockets the coin and says, A foreign duke came to Fudd's court and checked into the most expensive inn in the village. He hired a local interpreter because he did not speak our language. As he was unpacking, two masked bandits burst in, swords in their hands. They demanded the duke's famous jewels. The interpreter translated their demands. In his native tongue, the duke told the bandits to go... Um, uh, to go away. He had no jewels. One of the bandits said, We know he has jewels. We're going to count to three. If we don't get the jewels, we're going to cut his head off. The interpreter conveyed the message to the duke, who said in his own language, I don't want to die. Tell them that the jewels are hidden in the false bottom of the trunk. The interpreter said to the bandits, He said he'd rather die than tell you where the jewels are. Oh dear. Uh, this is the village green. The old ice cream shop he is to the east. The village square lies to the north, and Oryx's house of torches is to the west. The green runs down to the shore of the village duck pond. Okay. Oryx rushes out to meet you and says nervously, Sir Eric, what a pleasure to see you again. It's a pity that you caught me just as I was about to close, but here, why don't you take this torch? It's on the house. The shopkeeper wrenches the torch free from the wall and presses it into your hands. Then he tr retreats into the building and flips over the design so it re now reads closed. Oh dear. Uh, ice, ice cream shoppy. This is a small ice cream shop that is extremely cold and uncomfortable. Teeny just stands behind the counter shivering almost uncontrollably, even though he is wearing lots of heavy clothes and some earmuffs. On the wall behind him is a sign. There is a fireplace in the corner. The only exit is to the west. Welcome to Baskin Bobbins, says the boy. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, talk to Bobbin. Those look like really nice earmuffs. Really? I hate them. I only got them because it's always so cold in here. Hey, I'm over here. Sorry, I was just thinking about the music from Swan Lake. Ah, so this is a reference to Loom, which is a game we've already played before on this channel. I think I just saw your mother out on the duck pond. Stop kidding around, are you going to buy anything or not? I'd like to try one of your 32 flavours. Sorry, I, uh, someone has, al has eaten almost everything. I only have enough left for the root beer float special. I'd like to buy a root beer float. Certainly, that will be one gold coin, please. Maybe I'll check back with you later. I don't think I have the money for that yet. Uh, I assume I'm supposed to put the kindling in the fireplace, light it with the torch, and then I get the earmuffs. I don't yet know why I'd need the earmuffs, but that seems logical to me. Uh, put kindling in the fireplace. You put the kindling in the fireplace. Uh, use. Is use not an action? Can I not use the mouse? I can't use the mouse while mouse while there's uh, something partially written. Goodness, it looks like use isn't an action. Uh, oh, I could try burn kindling with the torch. 
You hold the torch to the kindling. It catches fire immediately. A flame licks out and burns your hand. You drop the torch itself into the fire where, it quick, where it's quickly consumed. Soon the room is roasting hot. Robin says, thanks, I guess I won't be needing these anymore. He removes his earmuffs and tosses them to you. Okay. Now, I'm fairly certain, from what I recall, I'm supposed to take some water from the pond, plant the bean in the packet by the... Um, by the wizard tower and then put the water on top of it. Uh, oh, I already have access to the beam, that's okay. So, the question is, how do I carry the water? Presumably in the helmet. helmet in duck pond. You dip your helmet into the pond and fill it with water. Excellent. North. Uh, someone tosses the bard a copper penny. He pockets the coin and says, what does a female millipede do when she doesn't want to make love? She crosses her legs and says, no, no, a thousand times no. So I want to put Bean in garden, presumably, if it's the garden that's next to the tower. Yes, put Bean in garden. Removing the bean from the packet first, you plant the bean in the garden. Uh, put water on Bean. You pull the water onto the bean. There is a flash of light and suddenly a tall, thin beanstalk spirals up to the side of the tower. Spirals up the side of the tower. This seems like a good time for, good time for a quick save. Uh, up? Is that an action? You clamber up the beanstalk. You poke your head in the window and see a bizarre figure seated in a chair. He appears to be a wizard, but it's not like any mage you've ever seen before. The figure looks up from the box he is watching and speaks. Oh, there you are. I was wondering what was keeping you, and then I lost track of the time. The darn giants can't win a game to save their lives. I just know I'm going to lose that bet with Merlin. He stares up at the ceiling. Hmm, I wonder if he's been rigging games again. He suddenly seems to notice you all over again and says, Yes, well, be that as it may, what you need to do here is fetch me a root beer float. He flips a gold coin at you. Come back when you've got it, and then we'll talk. The coin sails out of the window and floats lazily past your head. It comes to a stop in midair and hovers just beyond your, your reach. You hang onto the beanstalk and lean way over. The stalk starts to pull away from the tower. You grab the coin just as the vine pulls clear and you come crashing to the ground. Uh, the beanstalk shrivels up and disappears. The score has just gone up by five. Ah, that's interesting. I can certainly get the root beer float. But I don't know how I get back up to where he is. Um, south. Someone tosses the bard a copper penny. He pockets the coin and says, Realising that she's been too permissive with her three youngsters, a mother decides to take them in hand by starting with their tendency to curse. The next morning, the three wild ones sit at the breakfast table. The mother asks, Gaharis, what do you want for breakfast? Gaharis says, I'll have some of that darn dry meal. At the epithet, the mother sees Red. Hauling off, she slaps Gatheris halfway across the room. She has her second son. Bors, what he wanted. Uh, Bors says, I'll have some of that darn dry cereal. 
Once again, the mother lets go. This time the victim bounces off one wall and into, the, into another. The mother turns to Gareth. Her third son, what do you want for breakfast? Gareth says, you can bet your backside it won't be that darn dry cereal. <laughs> yes, quite. Um, where am I going? Baskin and Bobbins, isn't it? Presumably, I just give him the coin. Give coin to Bobbin. You give the gold coin to Bobbin. He messes around with the kettle for a few moments, then hands you a root beer float. Suddenly, another gold coin appears in your hand. Someone tosses the bard a silver penny. He pockets the coin and launches into a long song about the mother of all jousts. Okay, I've got the root beer float. How do I get up there? How do I get up there? Um, maybe there's a way on the inside? I know it said I could get to the Queen's, or the Queen's quarters were available up there, going up this way. Doorway leads up to the Queen's chambers, but is guarded by an alert soldier. Talk to soldier. What's going on upstairs? Sir Pectoral and Queen Morgana are in a private, uh, conference. They're not to be disturbed. If I told you I was here on the king's business, would you let me go up? No, I would laugh in your face. I'm here on the king's business. Ha ha ha. Look, it's Halis Comet. Nice try, but you still can't go up. Why don't you go cavort with the other knights for a while? I'll stand guard here for you. Okay. Oops, sorry, I just remembered. My cavorter is broken. Uh, if I gave you a nice shiny gold coin, would you let me up the stairs? Sure. Well, we can do that, can't we? Give coin to soldier. The guard pockets a coin but makes no move to step aside. He grins at you and says, Sucker, a moment late, you notice that a new coin has appeared in your hand. Okay, that's not much help. Uh... I distinctly recall from when I played this before that you can uh, give the gold coin to the bard which causes him to launch into a very long song that puts everyone to sleep. Presumably I could wear the earmuffs to not fall asleep. The only issue is I'm not sure what that would achieve. Maybe I could get him to go sing to the knights? Someone tosses the bard a silver penny. He pockets a coin and launches into a long song about the quest for the Holy Grill. Talk to... Bard. Tell me about the Epic of Balder. It is the greatest story ever told. Of course, to hear it, you'll need to give me a gold coin. Most people can't wear purple, but on you it looks awful. And good day to you too, Sir Eric. Why do bards always sound so funny? If you told jokes all day without going to the bathroom, you'd stand funny too. Are your legs naturally grey or are you just wearing pantyhose? This is a gap of my trade, my good man. Why are you hiding all those coins people keep tossing you? Why do you think my pants look like they swallowed a pumpkin? Did you? Uh, okay. I'm not sure how this is going to help us, but... Um... May as well see what happens. You put on the earmuffs. Everything seems a little quieter than it did before. The vanilla is almost gone. That will be the float. The, the, um, the root beer float. Give coin to Bard. The Bard abruptly stops singing and pockets a coin. He clears his throat and begins speaking. The Epic of Boulder. Sorry. The Epic of Boulder. He announces dramatically. In the great days of Baldur, many years ago, when the land was dark, a brave knight ventured into the Forest of Doom. You can still hear the bard through the earmuffs, but somehow they are screening out whatever is making everyone else drowsy. Suddenly you notice that another gold coin has appeared in your hand. Wait. 
Time passes. Everybody around you starts to get drowsy. Okay, let's try going north now and see if that's knocked out the guards. Uh, something around the Bard's delivery prevents you from leaving, even though the ear must shield you from the full impact of the boring epic. Everyone around you seems to have fallen asleep. Okay. What good is that, though? Wait. Time passes. Pont sees that you haven't fallen asleep, then he notices the ear must and says, What a great idea. This story is so boring that even I have to work hard to stay awake. If it's so boring, you ask, why do you keep it in your repertoire? Because if you're a bard, people expect you to know it. Besides, I've heard that it's a favourite of the Knights of the Rumboy table. Despite all the honours I've received in my career, I've still never performed in Fudd's Feasting Hall. The Epic of Balder is my best chance to make that dream come true. Uh, well, if performing for the Knights of the Rumboy table is so important to you, I can arrange it. All you have to do is follow me. Are you interested? Most certainly. Just give me a moment. The bard walks over to the sleeping crowd and shouts, Wake up! Show's over! Go home! The people climb groggily to their feet and then stumble away. Then the bard turns back to you and says, Lead on, young man. Whither thou goest, thither shall I follow. Okay, so that has in fact helped us. Uh, the last of the vanilla melts away. All you are left with now is some root beer. That's a shame. But again, I don't know how I would get back up the tower. Uh, Ponce launches into the epic of Balder. The hall instantly falls silent. In the great days of Balder, you went until the soldiers have fallen asleep. Right, let's go up now. You step over the guard and climb the stairs. At the top, you hear voices coming from the che Queen's chamber. You pause in the vestibule and cautiously peek through the curtains into the next room. And the hardest part of the whole plan was to make sure that the shop steward assigned the quest to that idiot Eric. Of course, I had to sleep with the man. Several times, in fact. But that's a small price to pay, don't you think so, my darling Pectoral? Uh, I guess so. You recognise the voice of Sir Pectoral, the hunk. Where did your sister take L'Oreal? To her castle, of course. Eric will never be able to cross Taurus in time to rescue the princess. And even if he does, he'd still have to get by the guardians of the Black Gate. But enough of that. Have you done as I requested, darling Pex? Yes, your highness. I've arranged for a group of soldiers to begin following Eric at the end of the day. As soon as he leaves the village, they will arrange an accident for him. Questing is such a dangerous occupation, you know. Good. You must go now. It's grown strangely quiet downstairs. You hear Sir Pictorial start to leave, and you race down the stairs before he can discover you. Uh, as you reach the bottom of the stairs, you hear the bard say, And thus endeth the Epic of Balder. The revellers slowly begin to awaken from their slumber. A drunken knight looks up at you and yells, Hey, it's mighty Sir Almeric himself. How did you get that quest, sonny? It should have been me. Okay, so let's advance the story. But I still don't know what I'm to do next. A drunken soldier blocks your path and says, Where do you think you're going, Shorty? Another knight speaks up, You, huh? I'm the one who should have received the quest. My armor is the shiniest of anyone here. Oh yeah, replies the first knight. Blow it out your pauldrons, pal. Hmm. Time passes. The two warring knights leap to their feet. A third jumps between them and says, Peace, brothers. This is no way for the knights of the rhomboy table to behave. The two knights look at each other, lower their heads, and then simultaneously slug the interfering knight in the jaw. He staggers back into some other knights, who catch him and help him launch a counter-attack. Soon the entire room has become a chaotic melee of knights hacking and slashing at each other. Pons look at the warring behemoths and says, That's good enough for me! I'm out of here! He gives you a copy of the commemorative book he gives all his clients and then leaves. Can I leave now? No. Suddenly a cold wind blows through the chamber and the knights suspend the fighting. Bud the wizard appears in a shower of sparks and says, Hold, knight of Fudd, know ye not that the rightful hero of this quest has been determined by the stars? Let us go to the village green where the gods have prepared a sign that we might truly learn the identity of the knight who has been destined since the beginning of time to quest forth in search of the princess L'Oreal. Bud waves his hand and suddenly the entire company is magically transported to the village green. This is the village green. 
The old ice cream shop is to the east, the village square lies to the north, and Auric Tales of Torches to the west. The green runs down to the shore of the village duck pond. You see a stone here. In the stone you see a banana. One after another, all the knights try to pull the banana from the stone. They all fail. Eventually a hush falls over the group, and everyone looks at you expectantly. Pull banana. You grasp the banana and pull it effortlessly from the stone. You turn to face the assembled multitude and raise the banana high above your head. Behold, you cry, Excalibur banana! You pause for dramatic effect and then continue. You are all witness. I have pulled the sacred banana from the stone. The knight stare at you for a moment. And then one of them says, Stupid quest anyway. Probably get killed, another says. I'd bet on it, says a third. How much? Ten gold pieces. Will you give odds? Thousand to one. The knights cluster around the odds maker, trying to get a bet down against your success, and they all wander off in a clump. Suddenly the air around you shimmers and Bud the Wizard appears once again. This time he has brought the furnishings of his room with him. Your score has just gone up by 15. Jeez, you sure pick awkward times to interrupt. Just hold on a moment, okay? The Wizard looks down at the magic screen in front of him. Suddenly he gets very excited and shouts, It's up! It's good! After a moment he calms down and turns his attention back to you. By now, Eric, you have learned that the evil Queen Morgana is behind the kidnapping of L'Oreal the Worthy. The Queen has imprisoned the girl at the castle of her sister, an exceedingly wicked witch. She plans to marry the princess off to a beast from the other side of Taurus. If she is successful, then Griselda the Hefty will inherit the throne, and Morgana will rule with Griselda as her puppet. Your quest, Eric, is to travel across the length and breadth of Taurus and rescue L'Oreal from the witch's castle. The gate to this castle has been magically sealed for centuries. I even sent a candygram there once, but the messenger never returned. In order to unseal the witch's gate, you need to find the Pitchfork of Damocles, the Crescent Wrench of Armageddon, the Raw Stake of Eternity, the Crowbar of the Apocalypse, and the Bolt Cutters of Doom. These magic items were scattered across Taurus many thousands of years ago. I spent many a lonely hour studying long forgotten grimoires and ancient tomes, and finally I have learned where each of them can be found. Oh sorry, came to rest. The pitchfork of Democles is entangled in the leaves of the tallest tree in the enchanted forest. The crescent wrench of Armageddon hides deep within the walls of Blissester Castle. The raw stake of eternity is guarded by the dreaded Stygian dragon, the crowbar of the apocalypse rests somewhere in the mists that enshroud the mountain of the gods, and the bolt cutters of, Dune are kept, of doom are kept by a mysterious enchanter who lives in the swamp of perdition. Although you must make this journey alone, Eric, I shall be with you in spirit, as long as the packers aren't playing that day. I give, you, I give to you this magic backpack, the properties of which will become evident as your quest progresses. What you must do now, Eric, is throw the magic banana into the duck pond. Thereafter, any time you are near a body of water, you can call the magic banana to your side by using Yuhu, the ancient spell of summoning. So, a body of water, specifically. The image starts to fade, but then grows stronger again. By the way, you can forget about getting that root beer float. The way the giants are playing, I had to mix myself up something a little stronger. Goodbye, Eric. The image flickers and then is gone. But disappears, and once again you're alone. Throw banana into uh, what do they call it? Is it pond? No, duck pond. An arm emerges from the water and catches a banana. It waves the fruit around three times and then slides back down into the water. As it disappears from sight, you hear a mighty thunderclap. The noise scares some horses that were grazing nearby. They bolt towards you. You catch a bridle but can't catch the horse. Or can't control the horse. The herd thunders toward Oryx's House of Torches and levels the building completely. 
you lose your footing and get dragged several miles. By the time you work yourself free, you find yourself at the edge of the enchanted forest. Exhausted from your day's efforts, you lay down to rest. Meanwhile... How nice to see you, L'Oreal. So kind of you to pay me a visit. This must be the Queen's sister. Who we're seeing right now. Set me free, you. You witch! How dare you kidnap me? My father will have you killed for this. Nonsense, my dear. Your father will be dead by the end of the week. Your stepsister, Griselda, will be by his side when he dies. Through her, Morgana, I shall rule all of Taurus. Oh, Morgana and I shall. Uh, you'll never get away with it. The Knights of the Rhomboid Table will surely come and rescue me. Them? Ha! Huh. At the very moment, they are drinking and cavorting in their feasting hall. Only one so-called so knight is coming after you, my pretty. Eric the Unready, you may as well give up now. No, Eric is noble and bold. If he has undertaken the quest to rescue me, then I know he shall do it. Guard, take her to the dungeon. Godspeed, Sir Eric. You are my only hope. Cemetery. This is a very spooky cemetery on the eastern edge of the enchanted forest. It is dotted with decrepit gravestones. One particularly large sepulchre is nearby looking like an oversized square bathtub with a lid on it. On the lid you see a newspaper. Uh, let's have a quick save here. Then we'll read the newspaper and then we'll uh, continue. Eric discovers Miracle Diet. I ate 125 bananas in two days and lost 50 pounds, says Eric. Again, that's not quite how I remember it. Killer Earthquake destroys Oryx. A very selective earthquake struck Oryx's House of Torches yesterday. Although no trembles were felt elsewhere in the village, the quake completely leveled Oryx's establishment. This is the second time in as many months Oryx has suffered a catastrophic loss. It just goes to show that the gods can strike with pinpoint accuracy, said one religious leader. Oryx must have... Um, upset them big time. Psychic predicts Minstrel will rise from dead. Leading Psychic, Phineas the Seer, has predicted that the spirit of the late Minstrel, Elvis Presley, will rise from the dead tonight. Pussy is buried in the cemetery at the edge of the Enchanted Forest. Phineas is selling tickets to the event to which he has acquired sole promotional rights. He expects a crowd of several thousand fans who will carry a torch for the late singer. Stunning scientific breakthrough. Scientists have discovered new properties of the Rodenber uh, Roddenberry bush. Long treasured by villagers of the Rim countries for its dye, the bush may now, now enter a period of more widespread popularity. It is now known that eating Roddenberries heightens one's sense of direction. While this goes a long way towards explaining the lack of signposts in Rimward villages, the discovery is expected to be most in of most interest to, to explorers of the Great Sarali Desert. Personal. Peter, I won't be able to make it this year. Something's come up. Say hi to the kids and tinker for me. Love, Wendy. <laughs> Help wanted. Crime fighting knight of darkness seeks junior partner. Must be able to climb vertical walls, have good working knowledge of sacred aphorisms, and be willing to answer the name Boy Wonder. Res res resumes only to B. Wayne. That's obviously a Batman reference. For sale. Iron Mask. Excellent condition. Only one previous owner. Confidential sale, no names please. I don't get that reference. Um, career opportunity, openings for young boys interested in relieving older people of their burdens. Must have quick feet and nimble fingers. 
Contact Fagin, Lower Wimpole Street. So that's a reference to Oliver. Um, general interest. Hello, sailor. Lost in the inner sea. Tired of blundering aimlessly from island to island. Missed your loved ones? Send away now for our Odyssey map. Show all known nautical hazards, including sea monsters, clashing rocks, and unsavory islands. Order now and we'll throw in Songs of the Circle. Music guarantees to hold your attention every time you hear it. Oh, sorry, not Circle. Cirque. Uh, that might be a reference to the Odyssey, the Greek tale by Homer. Might be something else that I'm not getting. General interest. I buy spare body parts. Fair prices. No question asked. Come to the back door of the castle on the hill. Ask for Igor. So that's presumably a Frankenstein reference. Um, legal notice. Be it known to all that from this day forward that I, Ishmael, now wish to be called Frank. I'm not sure what that's a reference to. Anyway. And that seems to be it. Uh, so we'll do a little take all. Okay, nothing to take presumably. Um, hmm. I notice that the verbs on the left hand side have changed. The, the sort of short list that it gives you. I wonder if in each section of the game that updates to the list of verbs that it thinks you'll need for that specific section. Uh, section. Open, open sepulchre. You can't seem to get a good grip on the lid to open the sepulchre. Fair enough. I was only, um, I know of no reason why I'd want to go in there. It just seemed like a thing to do since the game was making such a point of it. Enchanted forest. You are deep in the heart of the enchanted forest, sinister looking trees loom all around you, and every time you look away you could swear you see them changing positions out of the corner of your eye. One tree in particular seems to be regarding you with evil intent, its gnarled roots look like they're just waiting for an opportunity to trip you up. The way back to the cemetery lies to the east, and the path continues to the west. Uh, I still have the float, don't I? Examine float. It looks pretty much like root beer on all on our world, all brown, syrupy, and fizzy. Now, is that going to be alcoholic? I don't know what. Uh, I don't know precisely what uh, an American would understand a root beer to be. I looked it up. It is an American company, Legend Entertainment. Give. Uh, float to roots, maybe? Tree. Tree roots. Removing the float from the backpack first, you bring the float down close to one of the roots. It slivers up to do an inspection and knocks the float out of your hand. The liquid seeps into the ground at the base of the tree. Suddenly, all the roots spring straight up like the hair on the back of a scared cat. They start to quiver and then they begin to weave around drunkenly. A few of the smaller ones start singing a song about their dear mother that they left behind in Ireland. Well, that's progress. Uh, was it... We came from the east? I think so. You squeezed by the weaving roots and head deeper into the forest. Uh, clearing. You've arrived in a clearing at the very centre of the forest. An enormous tree grows here and the wizard's words immediately echo in your mind. The pitchfork of Damocles is entangled in the leaves of the tallest tree in the enchanted forest. Barely able to contain your excitement, you uh, sight up along the tree. High above you, the trunk branches out into roots. Slowly, even for you, comprehension dawns. Um, sorry, I've missed, lost my place. Um, there, slowly, even for you, comprehension dawns. The tree is growing upside down. Whatever leaves it may have must be hidden underground. At the base of the tree is an unruly pile of branches. The way back into the forest lies to the east. Uh, can I take branches to move them out the way? You push aside the pile of branches and discover an ancient trap door set into the ground. Open uh, trap door. You grasp the ring and pull. 
The door creaks open, creating yet another opportunity for neat sound effects. For a neat sound effect. You see a gloomy set of stairs leading underground. I wonder if this game was supposed to have sound effects that aren't playing. Oh well. Um, I hardly think it would be appropriate for me to stop playing now and start doing some... Uh, uh, debugging to see. You start to feel your way down the stairs. As soon as you disappear below ground level, you hear a crash overhead. Looking up, you see the trapdoor quivering with satisfaction that it has lived up to its name. You continue down the stairs, and at the bottom you walk through a revolting spiked turnstile. On the other side of the door is a sign. West of the house. You are standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. You see a small mailbox here. Now this, I believe, is a reference to Zork which is a very famous adventure game. I believe this is how one of the Zork games begins, which is probably why it's uh, the game's suddenly gotten rid of all the graphics as a sort of homage. Uh, open mailbox. You open the mailbox and discover some mail. Take mail. You take the mail from the mailbox. Examine mail. If the note is from the dwarves' clearing house, yes, Fonda Blindlecrank, you may have already run the grand prize in the uh, 115th annual Make a Wish sweepstakes. Soon you and all the little Bindle cranks could be enjoying the dream of a lifetime. Simply bring this winning notice to our headquarters in the Great Cavern and our coaches and friendly staff will tell you which of our fabulous prizes you have won with absolutely no sales pressure to buy one of our magazines or sit for an incredibly boring presentation on vacation real estate. Um, take board. Let's see if we can remove those boards from the house. You strain at the board, but can't seem to make it budge. Perhaps I'll have to come back here later. Uh, what happens if I take all? Is there anything else here? No. North is presumably into the house, so let's go west. Cavern. This is a huge underground cavern. There are buildings to the north, east and south. High above you, the branches of, the, of a tree are sticking down from the roof of the cavern. In the branches you see the pitchfork of Damocles. The little white house lies somewhere out of sight to the east. Okay, let's try going south. Publisher's Clearing House. This is the lobby of a small building. There is a dwarf standing in front of a wall full of redwood clocks. The only way out is to the north. Uh, was this what the mail was about? Uh, talk to Ed McDwarf. Also, well, that's a bit rude. You know, if you keep your mouth open like that, a bug might fly in. I see you left the really big tie at home. Good move. Please wait a minute while my eyes adjust to the glare coming off your head. What happened to my screen back when I first came through the revolving door? Uh, it was just a nostalgic flashback on the part of the author. Don't worry about it. I'm done talking for now. What a disappointment. You're breaking my heart. Uh, give mail to Ed McDwarf. I'm pretty sure this is the uh, the same place. The dwarf holds out a redwood clock and starts to hand it to you, then gives the ticket a broad glance. My goodness, an actual winner. Sorry, my gods, an actual winner. He quickly recovers his composure and says, ahem, that is to say, another winner. Among many in our fine, absolutely legal, with no hanky-panky sweepstakes. He compares your number to the one on the list. Well, Mr. Bindlecrank, I'm happy to say you've won an all-expensive paid. He glances up at you and frowns. Wait a minute, you don't look like a dwarf. May I see some sort of ID, please? Uh, okay, and then there's uh, northeast we can also go. And south presumably goes back to the... Um, back to the White House. 
The sweepstake notice comes sailing through the door after you. As you scoop it up, you hear the dwarf call from inside. Come back when you can prove your identity. Franz Rock Emporium. You walk into a veritable showcase of rocks. Big rocks, little rocks, shiny rocks, dull rocks, precious stones, space metals. The only exit is to the southwest. Behind the counter is Fran, a plaid clad dwarf. Can I interest you in anything, Fran asks. I was looking for something in a rock, you reply. Ah, well, you've come to the right place. Just look around and let me know if there's anything that catches your fancy. And remember, there's a free bungee cord with every purchase to lash the rock to your cart to help you get it home. And then counter you see a headrest special and a starter rock. Uh, take all. No. Uh, talk to Fran. What line of work are you in? I sell rocks to miners. Every dwarf in the NSGUE knows that if you need a rock, come to Franz. How are your prices? We've got the lowest prices anywhere. That's because we're underground. Aha. Uh -huh. You don't have a cousin named Stan, do you? Oh, that's a Monkey Island reference. Which we've also played on this channel. Nope, no, certainly not. Oh yes, but I don't want to talk about him. I don't have any money, but I really like one of those rocks. Sorry, cash only. Why don't you come back later? Oh dear. Uh, can I take the starter rock? You can't get at the starter rock. The display can only be opened by Fran. Uh, buy starter rock? Fran says, sure, 20... Zonk mid ought to do it. Hmm. Uh, what was that book I got before? Uh, as you open the book, a coupon flutters out and you grab it in midair. When you return your attention to the book, your eye falls on the lines. In the great days of Boulder, you immediately begin to fall sleepy, but you manage to stamp the book shut before any serious damage is done. That was the book that the... Um... Bard gave me when he was uh, fleeing from the uh, fleeing from the feasting hall as the uh, knights began to fight amongst themselves. Examine coupon. Good for five free acting lessons with the bard. I could give the coupon to Fran and see if he's interested in a trade. Oops, that should have been two Fran. Give coupon two Fran. It's nice, but I wouldn't give you a rock for it. Uh, do I have anything else? I don't think so. I mean, I do have other items, but I don't see anything here that... That I'd immediately think he'd want. Maybe the book? Removing the book from the pack back first. Fran shies away from you as you hand as if you had the play. Where have you been living? A, co a convent? Everyone knows that that book will put you to sleep in seconds. Um, okay. As you head for the door, Fran rushes up to you and says, No first time customer of Fran's ever leaves empty handed. You thrust a pickaxe into your hands. This is a minor starter kit. Go to see of the Taurus Department of Public Works. Use it in good health, and next time you need a rock, be sure to come to Franz. Okay, can I use the pitchfork to help me get through... Sorry, not the pitchfork, the pickaxe to help me get through the boards. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, east. White House is to the east. I take it I can't just go north, can I? No. Uh, so, what do I want to do here? There's no use verb. Open. Board with pickaxe, maybe? 
You slip the business end of the pickaxe under the board and give it a good heave. The board pops loose and you push it to one side. Progress. You squeeze through the opening of the door and find yourself in a kitchen that reeks of garlic. A quick survey of the room reveals nothing of interest. Holding your breath, you dash into the living room. Uh, this is a dark room with a trophy case along one wall and an ancient oriental rug on the floor. Stairs lead up to the second floor and the kitchen lies to the west. There appears to be a beard in that trophy case. Open trophy case. Ah well, you have a slight difficulty there. The case appears to be locked and this, this is an adventure game. I can hardly allow you to open it unless you supply the proper key. That quibble aside, however, I consider your input to have been absolutely first rate. Well, thank you, Mr. Developer. Uh, let's try going upstairs. You race up the stairs. Bedroom. Ah! This is a... Uh, I noticed there's uh, quite a few bones in here. This is a small bedroom on the second floor of the house. There is a pile of bones here that appears to have fallen for a hole in the ceiling that leads to the attic. Um, examine bones. They're too long to be dwarven bones. They must be human. Uh... Oh, what I really want to do is search them. Enter bones? You can't enter the pile of bones. Uh, push bones. You sift through the pile and discover a driver's license which you immediately pick up. Okay, I'm guessing the driver's license and the beard are going to help me um, form a fake identity for uh, collecting that prize. I also noticed that there's a kneel verb that's on my sh uh, quick list on the left, so I want from supposed to kneel down as well. Fonda Bindlecrank, age 437, height 3 foot 6 inches, the pictures of a luxurious beard with what may be a dwarf behind it. So how did his driver's license end up underneath a pile of human bones? Bit uh, concerning. Okay, I can't go up then. Down. Push a rug, there might be something under it. You roll back the rug and discover a trapdoor. There is indeed. Open trap door. You struggle with the heavy door and manage to raise it a few inches. A muffled voice comes from somewhere down below. Haven't you people bothered me enough already? Go away. A frail white arm emerges and hands you a key, then it disappears into the darkness again and pulls the door shut after it with a decisive bang. Well that was unexpected. Open trophy case with the key. You unlock the case with the key and it swings open. Take beard. Take the beard from the trophy case. Okay. I think between the license, the beard and kneeling, we should be able to get our prize now. Kneel. You kneel down. Wear beard. You put on the beard. Which direction was it? Was it south to go into the clearing house? Yes. Um, give license to Ed McDwarf. The dwarf glanced at the license and handed it back to you. Sorry, I can't give you a prize just for showing me a driver's license. Do I need to show you the mail again? Uh, the dwarf pulls out a red clock and starts to hand it to you. Then he gives the ticket a world glance. My god, an actual winner. He quickly recovers his composure and says, Ahem, that is to say another winner. Among many in our fine, absolutely legal, no hanky-panky sweepstakes. He compares your number to the one on his list. Well, Mr. Bindlecrank, I'm happy to say you've won an all-expensive paid. He glances up at you and says, Oh, I almost forgot. We've been getting some fraudulent claims recently. May I see your ID again, please? The beard begins to itch. Give license to Ed McDwarf. He glances at the license and says, Alright, uh, Fonda Bindlecrank. 
Uh, let us see what you've won. It's an all expenses paid day at the Magical Dwarf's theme park, courtesy of the Magic Construction Company. He takes you by the arm and walks you out into the Great Cavern. There, like high-speed time-lapse photography, a construction crew builds a huge theme park right before your eyes. The dwarf pats you on the arm and says, enjoy. He disappears. Kevin, you are standing on the midway of a crowded carnival. Right next to you is a huge ferris wheel whose cars almost brush the leaves of the tree hanging down from the cavern roof. To the west is a game booth. To the south east and south west are rides. Franz Rock Emporium can still be entered to the north west, northeast. The dwarf's clearing house is still visible to the south and the little white house lies somewhere to the east. One of the seats of the ferris wheel dangles in front of you. You see a lever there. Uh, skeleton key? Where did that come from? Examine skeleton key. It's a long thin key made out of pure white bone. Looking at it, you briefly wonder why they call them skeleton keys. Then you shudder and turn your attention elsewhere. Oh, that was the key I picked up for the uh, case, clearly. Maybe this uh, also some... Maybe this um, might provide some additional insight into the pile of bones in Mr. Bing Bindlecrank's house. Uh, okay. Pull cool lever. You throw the lever and hear a faint click. The beard is really itching. You begin to scratch wildly. Oh, I should remove the beard, shouldn't I? Remove beard. You take off the beard and breathe a self relief. That sucker really itches. Um. So I suppose I want to enter the seat now. Enter seat. You rise from your knees and sit down in the chair. Oh, still kneeling. Just outside the seat, but with an easy reach, is a control box with two buttons on it. One green and one red. Uh, push green button. The wheel starts to spin. You climb higher and higher. Now you're almost to the very top and you can see the pitchfork just ahead and above you. Far below you can see the theme park laid out on the cabin floor. You can see Franz Rockin' Porum and the Dwarves Clearing House. You even see the lever, although it looks like a matchstick from this height. Push red button. The red button is too far away. The wheel carries you back to the starting position. Wait. Um, throw rock at red button. There doesn't seem to be any rock here. Oh, do I not have the starter rock? Throw rocks at red button? The rocks are too far away. Okay. Interesting. Um... Can I leave the seat? Uh, the wheel is turning too fast for you to jump off. The wheel continues to spin, carrying almost to the top. You see the pitchfork in the branches just ahead and above you. The entire fairground is visible below you. Uh, wait. Push red button. You reach out and push the button. The wheel comes to a halt. Leave seat. You leap out of the seat and back onto solid ground. A dwarf family wanders by. The father addresses your navel. Great costume. The kids really go for that goofy looking human stuff. I worked my way through Rock U doing the same sort of thing. He presses 20 zomboy pieces in your hand. Good luck to you, the farmer wanders away. Oh, I didn't get the starter rock, did I? I got a starter pickaxe. The starter rock I didn't have enough money for, but now I do. Um, so was that south? What direction was it in? Northeast? Yes. Uh, okay. Let's buy starter rock. Friend reaches below the counter and hands you a rock about half the size of a dwarf's fist. For 20 zonk mids, we have this fine starter rock. With every cell, a free bungee cord to lash the rock. 
He stops in mid-sentence, looks first at the diminutive rock and then at the cord. Oh well, he continues, might as well take the cord anyway, I've got a deal on him. Uh, so I believe I now have the rock and the bungee cord. It would seem so. Southwest. Uh, okay. So I wonder... Maybe I just have to throw the rock at the pitchfork and it will fall down. Enter uh, seat. Push green button. Throw rock or starter rock. Starter rock at pitchfork. You throw the starter rock at the pitchfork. It falls to the floor nearby. The wheel carries you back down to the starting position. Push red button. When they say it falls nearby, do they mean the pitchfork or um, the rock? Leave C. Take pitchfork. The branches are far over your head. Okay, that didn't work then. Take starter rock. Uh, what else could I try? I could try what I was, tr uh, what I attempted before, where I f was trying to throw the rock at the red button to stop the Ferris wheel. Enter C. Push green button. Throw starter rock at red button. You throw the starter rock at the red button. It falls to the floor nearby. Nope, that didn't work. Push red button. Leave seat. Take. Um, starter rock. I've just noticed fine print. What does the fine print say? Examine fine print. Knowing your heart that. Only geeks read fine print. You never just look at the small words. bungee matic The only magic bungee cord that automatically knows the task you have in mind for it and expands or contracts as needed. The even smaller price uh, print below reads, so The bungee matic has not been tested by any government agency has not been approved for actual use. The bungee mark corporation will not accept liability for any failure, catastrophic or otherwise, of the bungee matic Have a nice day. Hmm... Can I use the bungee cord in some way? Tie bungee uh, cord to rock. The bungee cord shivers if it doesn't want to be attached to the starter rock. Tie bungee cord to me. Uh, why don't you wait until you're in a good spot to use a bungee cord? Okay, that's a good hint that I'm not supposed to use it yet. Hmm. I wonder what I could do here. I have the ferris wheel to get up high. What happens if I change the lever position? Push the green button, but nothing happens. Okay. That's interesting. So presumably if I were to pull the... Uh, lever while I was... At lever now, the ferris wheel would take off without me. Would get, would get going without me. Is that useful in any way? You hook the cord to the... Oh, hooking the cord to the wheel won't do you any good. Fair enough. Worth checking. Uh, 
Uh, leave C. Uh, push lever. Enter C. Okay, so the ferris wheel didn't start without me. So presumably the green button does nothing if the lever is uh, in the um, off position. Push green button. Maybe I could hit the lever with the rock. Throw starter rock at lever. You throw the start rock at the lever. It falls to the floor nearby. Um, push red button. Leave seat. Take starter rock. Okay. What what are all the uh, all the items that I have access to or are in the area? We have a backpack, a beard, a book, branches, bungee cord, control box, coupon, Ferris wheel, fine print, green button, lever, me, newspaper, pickaxe, pitchfork, red button. Rock, seat, skeleton key, starter rock, torties. Okay, I can think of two things I haven't tried. I could try throwing the rock at the branches, because previously I tried to throw them at the, the pitchfork itself. That might have been a mistake. The other thing I could try is I could try hooking the branches with the pitchfork. Um, how would I describe that with the verbs at my disposal? Give? Um, pickaxe to branches? Oh, I did pitch axe. <laughs> pickaxe to branches. The branches aren't likely to appreciate your offer. Push uh, pickaxe into branches? You're still not quite high enough to reach the branches. Okay, so that tells me that that isn't the solution. That whatever the solution is, it's nothing like that. I wonder if I could make a catapult using the bungee cord and something else. Pickaxe. The bungee cord shivers if it doesn't want to be attached to the pickaxe. I was only thinking about a catapult because there's a shoot action. The only place that we haven't been to is the attic, and I don't know if that's even accessible. The game seemed to indicate that I couldn't go there, and I don't have any items that would obviously make it possible now. Uh, out. Uh, there were a few other directions that opened up, weren't there? 
I've forgotten which ones are the new ones, but we could have a look. You enter a maze of twisty passages all alike. After about 20 minutes, you stumble back out. Okay, that didn't help. Uh, what other directions opened up? Was south east an option before? You try to get into the ever popular Dwarf Pirates of the Caribbean, but the lines are so long that you abandon the effort. Okay, so those two rides aren't any help. That makes me more confident that the solution is available to me right now. I just don't know what it is. Tie bungee cord to lever? No. What does Tortoise do again? Examine Tortoise. Testudinal muscle relaxant. I still feel like I'm going to have the best chance of doing this if I could get the ferris wheel to stop at the top. But to do that I'd have to be able to reach either the lever or the green button. Wait, can I get it started now? Push green button. You push the button and the wheel starts to spin. Okay. Has that actually done anything useful though? Probably not. Push red button. Is bungee cord control box. Examine control box. It's just a simple box with two buttons on it. One red, one green. Uh, coupon, ferris wheel, fine print, green button, lever, me, newspaper, pickaxe, pitchfork, red, bu red button, rock, seat, skeleton key, starter rock. Push green button. Right, what does that description say? The wheel starts to spin, you climb higher and higher, now you're almost to the very top and you can see the pitchfork just ahead and above you. Far below you can see the theme park laid out on the cabin floor. You can see Franz rocking for him in the dwarf's clearing house. You can even see the lever, although it looks like a matchstick from the side. Okay, so presumably I'm supposed to do something with the lever. Otherwise, why would the game be pointing it out to me? But I tried throwing the rock at it and that didn't work. Let's try that one last time, just in case I'm mistaken I didn't try it. 
Yeah, it didn't work. Push red button. Out. Take rock. See, with the magical bungee cord that will adjust to any length you need, I wondered if I could have tied it to it and then got on the ferris wheel and then had it um, shorten and pull the lever when I got up the top. Then, then again, looking at the uh, lever there, it looks like it's facing the wrong way anyway for that to work. What my actions? Buy, drop, enter, examine, get, give, look, open, pull, push, put, read, shoot, stand, take, talk to, throw, tie, undo, wait, wear. See, it's that shoot that, that I find curious. What happens if I just try and shoot rock? With what? Your finger? Shoot rock with bungee cord. You can't shoot anything with a bungee cord. Okay. There are definitely no items I'm missing. You walk into a veritable showcase of rocks, big rocks, little rocks, shiny rocks, dull rocks, precious stones, base metals, the only exit to the southwest. Behind the counter is Fran, a plaid clad dwarf. Can I interest you in anything, Fran asks? I was looking for something in a rock, you reply. Ah, well, you've come to the right place. Just look around and let me know if there's anything that catches your fancy. And remember, there's a free bungee cord of every purchase to lash the rock to your cart to help you get it home. Examine headrest. It's a solid rock, about two feet thick. You couldn't imagine sleeping anything more uncomfortable. Take headrest? You can't get the headrest special. The display can only open by Fran. Buy headrest. Certainly says Fran, that will be 2,000 zonk mids. I tried giving Fran the coupon earlier, didn't I? Yeah. What does NSGUE stand for? It stands for plenty. Oh, you mean the initials? They resent the not so great underground empire. Tell me about the headrest special. Now this is our top of the line rock. Look at the lines. Look at the the striation. Anyone would be proud to own this rock. High performance, low maintenance. Buy this rock and you'll be the MP of the NSGUE. Only 2,000 zonk mids. Uh, are any of the rocks... Are the rocks returnable? Absolutely not. Are any of these rocks used? We prefer the term previously owned, but don't worry. Each rock meets our high standards of durability and performance. We stand behind every rock we sell. So it's possible the headrest is something that I could acquire. Still not clear how that would help though. You enter a small booth where a dwarf has set up a table with some cards on it. Care for a game of mental skill? He asks. If you win, I'll give you a magic slingshot. Okay, that's what we were missing. If you lose, it costs you nothing. 
Good thing I happened to wander in the wrong direction. I could have easily missed that. Here's how we play. I'll deal out some cards face down and we'll take turns turning them over two at a time. If you make a match, you get another turn. Watch out though, because one of the cards is dynamite, which makes you lose your turn. Whoever gets the most matches wins. Ready? I'll go first. Okay. Parrot and the shovel. Helmet and a peg. I'm starting to forget them. I don't remember what they all were anymore. How has there not been a single match yet? Peg. Oh, and he got it. Now, if I, I'm pretty sure both of those have come up already. If I could remember. Oh no. Pretty sure he could win now. Oh, I didn't mean that one. And that was the dynamite. Oh, I'm tra playing atrociously, aren't I? I've just completely forgotten where everything was. Where was the other one? There it is. Was that down here? Yes. Down here? No. Oh no. I deserve that. I'm gonna lose this. Oh, I didn't even mean to click that. I was gonna get the pair of um, boxes. Oh, and I've forgotten where the box was now. Was it the one to the right of that? Yes. Was that there? Yes. 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 I don't remember where the other gold was. That was fortunate.
Oh, I did not deserve to win that. You win. Ten pairs to seven. Congratulations, he says. Here's your prize. It's a really great slingshot, but be careful. It's magic is that it will hit whatever you shoot at. He hands you the slingshot. Uh, well, goodbye. I really enjoy playing the game with you, but I don't have any more prizes. You can come back whenever you like, though, and we'll just play for fun. See you later. Okay, so I think we can do this now. Shoot lever with uh, starter rock. Oops, I misspelled that. Shoot lever with starter rock. The slingshot isn't loaded. Uh, okay. Put starter rock in slingshot. The rock fits snugly into the slingshot. Shoot lever. You take careful aim and fire away. The rock speeds through the air and strikes the lever, halting the ferris wheel. You are now directly below the pitchfork. Take pitchfork. The branches are still just out of reach. Um, push. Pickaxe through branches. Push. Pickaxe into branches. Oops. Push. Pickaxe into branches. Branches are still just out of reach. Okay. Uh, what do I have? I have backpack, beard, book, branches, bungee cord, control box, coupon, ferris wheel, fine print, green button, leather, meat, newspaper, pickaxe, pitchfork, red button, rocks, seat, skeleton key, slingshot, starter rock. I don't have that anymore, do I? Examine starter rock. It looks about half the size of a dwarf's fist. Take starter rock? I'm expecting this to fail. The starter rock is too far away. Yes. Uh, and I definitely can't take the, pick, the uh, pitch fork already. Stand? You stand up. Take pitchfork. You stretch out and grab the pitchfork. Your score has just gone up by 25. Wonderful. Now how do I get out of here? Ow? I can fly, I can fly, I can splat. You have failed. Undo. That's not quite what I meant. I was envisioning more of a careful climbing down, but still. You're standing in a ferris wheel that is motionless. The seat is at the top. You're right below the branches. You see the starter rock here. Pull branches? You try to give the branches a tug, but nothing comes of it. Ah. Uh... Tie bungee cord to C. Look over the available spots and realize that the cord would just slip off if you attach it to the wheel or the C. Ah, do I have any other holds? Tie bungee cord to branches. Ah, you hook one end of the bungee cord to a sturdy branch and the other to your clothing. The cord seems to relax and lengthen as if it knows you're about to ask. It just stretch a long distance. Out. You do a swan dive off the sea, gaining speed as you approach the floor of the cavern. You wonder if you should have read the small print on the bungee cord, the part where the lawyers say that if the product doesn't work, it's not their fault. At least you think. I'm not trying this at home. Then just as you come face to face with an ant, the bungee reaches its limit and snaps you back. You bounce a few times and then come to rest a few feet above the ground. Just as you start congratulating yourself, the far end of the cord comes free and you fall the remaining few feet to land flat on your... ...face in the dust. 
Dazed but unhurt, you struggle to your feet and pick up the bungee cord. You are immediately surrounded by a crowd of cheering dwarfs. Thank you for removing the dreaded the dread pitchfork which has been hanging over our heads low these many years. In gratitude, we would like to give you this rock. The crowd parts and Fran walks up carrying the headrest special. It gives it to you. The crowd disassembles the theme park and then melts away. I wonder what the headrest is, is uh, going to be used for. Um, right, east. Can I leave? Not that way. Can I use the headrest to get up and out of here? I mean, via the attic. Up. Um. Drop headrest. You drop the headrest. Up. You step onto the rock and pull yourself up into the attic. You're in a very dark, musty room. The ceiling seems to be a stone slab. It's dark enough in here that you're likely to be eaten by a gnu. Uh, that's not good. Do I have any way to illuminate uh, my surroundings? Up. You push aside the slab and climb out. You're in the middle of a graveyard. Mystic types surround the sarc sarcophagi you just climbed out of. They're in the middle of some ritual. They drop their torches and panic and flee. The underbrush catches fire quickly and the forest starts to vibrate with a low rumble. You recognize the symptoms of a completed quest and do a little fleeing yourself. <laughs> You run for what seems like hours through the dark forest, tripping and falling over roots and scattering all your possessions to the four winds. At last you emerge on the other side and collapse in exhaustion on the road uh, near a tavern. Meanwhile... Why haven't your men killed Eric yet, Sir Pectoral? Never fear, your highness. He has been lucky so far, but we but he will not elude us for long. But now that our mission is almost complete, your majesty, will you not share with me your plans for Taurus once that doddering fool Fudd is out of the way? Gladly, Sir Pectoral. Think of our kingdom as it is today, a provincial backwater with scarcely any social amenities or culture. First, see, our peasants are crude and uneducated. We need to attract a better class of people to the kingdom, people of refinement and taste. To do so, we must build luxurious dwellings of exquisite grandeur. Next, we must replace the paths and cow trails upon which we now travel with elegant, tree-lined avenues, whose classic proportions will be pleasing to the eye. Then we will begin to attract artisans from all over the world. They will come and decorate the walls of our city with the fruits of their artistic genius. As our city grows, we will create a merchant's quarter where people may come to buy and sell goods. Fine restaurants will open to cater to the international taste of those who travel here. By now we shall be the crossroads of Taurus, the royal family will move out of the stuffy old castle and into modern accommodation, 
commerce will flourish and the kingdom will be at the height of its glory. Finally, we shall reopen the castle as a tourist attraction that people may come and put witness how well we have preserved our unique culture. In this way it will never be said that we abandoned our precious heritage in the face of modern improvements. This is my dream, a shining city on the hill where beauty and culture abound, a place of Understated elegance where the arts flourish and every man is a connoisseur. Think of it, Sir Pectoral, and then compare it to the squalor in which we now live. Listen well, Sir Pectoral. All that stands in the way of this glorious future is that meddlesome Sir Eric. Find him, Pectoral. Find him and kill him lest we be doomed to our current way of life forever. You are standing on a road in front of a tavern that has an orange thatch roof. You can go north into the tavern or west along the road. The smeltering ruins of the enchanted forest lie beyond a barricade to the east. Let's have a quick save here, shall we? As soon as you start off down the road, you hear a rumbling behind you. Turning around, you spy a huge ox cart bearing down on you. You dive into a ditch on the side of the road while the cart passes. It is driven by a two-headed oaf who laughs at your misfortune. The cart is laden with still smouldering wood from the enchanted forest. As the cart pulls away, you read a sign on the back that says, How's my driving? Call 1-800... Um... And then an obscenity. You pull yourself to your feet again. Tavern. You enter the tavern and take a seat at the bar. A waiter glides by. He waves a menu and says, I'll be right with you. On the wall behind the bar is a display of a wide variety of keys and key blanks. In front of you, a young man stands reading a manual called Keys to Success. There's a sign over the bar. On the counter you see a newspaper. You take the newspaper from the counter. After several moments, a waiter comes and stands in front of you. Hello, he says. My name is Bruce and I'll be your waiter today. I'll just give you a moment there to settle in and then I'll be right back to let you look at your... back to let you look at the menu. He bustles off to wait on another customer. Uh, examine newspaper. I saw a bright light and a long tentacle, said one astonished white it. I... Eyewitness. It pulled Eric up into the mothership, then I blinked my eyes and it disappeared. Eric abducted by UFO. Enchanted forest, forest vanishes into thin air. The enchanted forest disappeared from sight yesterday. All that remains are a few smouldering ruins. The authority have made no comment, but one official admitted privately that he wasn't surprised. It ain't natural, said Gareth the Obsequious who spoke with us on the condition that we not identify him by name. All that magic lying around for so long, it's a wonder the whole thing didn't spontaneously combust years ago. Courtroom triumph for Black Knight. A surprise verdict was handed down yesterday at the end of two weeks of dramatic testimony, and all surf juries determined that the Black Knight has been systematically discriminated against in receiving territories to terrorise. It's a victory for everyone, said the knight on the courtroom steps. Now all knights everywhere can reap the full benefits inherent in the feudal system. The verdict of expected to spawn a spate of similar suits by the Hispanic Knight and the Thousand and One Arabian Knights. Recipes. Old fashioned unicorn chow. Take one dried leaf from a yucca gum tree and combine it with the tears of a virgin. This will create an irresistible treat for the unicorn. It will soon be eaten out of your hand. General interest. Failed wizard. Don't panic. Send away now for the... Semi-industrial light and magic's amazing bag of tricks includes assortment of fireballs, Doppler spells, invisibility spells, and other special visual effects. Personal. Godot. 
Where the heck were you? I waited all night. Beckett. S. Beckett. Don't get the reference, but I think that's a hysteri historical reference. Help wanted. Bell ringer. Modern cathedral seeks individual for belfry work. Must have excellent hearing. Good benefits package. Hump insurance included. So that's a Hunchback of Notre Dame reference. General interest, crossbow, extremely accurate, will sell for non-military use only, W. Tell. So that's a reference to William Tell. Uh, for sale, brass lantern, much used but still serves still. Come to Little White House, ask for you. I wonder if that's another Zork reference. Career advice, career in a rut, are you a printer without a plan? Write to me for a comprehensive blueprint of the path to power. Remember, nice goes finish last. Machiavelli, that's another historical reference. Uh, legal notice, posted, I will no longer be responsible for the debts of uh, Mr. Hyde, D. Jackal. That's a Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde reference. And we're done. A patron in one of the booths orders a mead light. Someone in the next booth says, I'll bet he ordered that because it has less taste than regular mead. No, says someone else. He ordered it because it's more filling. Less taste, replies the first. More filling, insists the second. The drink arrives and the customer takes it. You're both wrong, he says, chewing off the top of the bottle. I ordered it because I like the easy opening bottles. He spits out some glass shards and drains the bottle, which then magically disappear. The other customers lapse into an uncomfortable silence. Bruce wanders by, by again and says thank you for waiting for today's specials we have. He clears his throat and sings fa la la la. Mead Florentine. Mead Florentine. Mead Florentine. And smoky tra la la. Smoky tra la la. Yes smoky tra la la la. Mountain mead. He finished with an exaggerated flourish and bells deeply from the waist. Then he says I'll be back in a minute to take your order. Let's examine the menu. You can't get a good look at it while Bruce is holding it. Uh, Bruce pauses briefly on his way to another table. Everything alright? Eh? Good. He minces away. Uh, take menu. Trained as you are in the knightly virtues, you realise it wouldn't be chivalrous to simply grab the menu away from Bruce. You catch Bruce's eye from across the room. He nods and waves his menu, but then gets distracted and moves on to another customer. Huh. It's possible I don't need the menu. Uh, can I talk to Bruce? Talk to Bruce. I like your outfit. Lavender suits you. Oh, this old thing? It is rather tricky. Uh, um, it is rather kicky though, isn't it? Not sure what kicky means in this context. Do you like your job? Oh, this is just my day job. My real home is in the arts. Why won't you let me order a drink? Of course you can order a drink, silly. Just pick something off the menu. We certainly wouldn't stay in business long if people couldn't order drinks. Do you recommend anything in particular? Well, everything's pretty good, but I'd stay away from the drinks that have mead in them. <laughs> uh, please, please, please give me a menu. I haven't given you a menu yet, silly me. I forgot my head if, I wasn't, if it wasn't screwed on. I guess talking to you isn't doing me much good. Bruce finally comes and steps in front of you. Sorry for the delay, he says. It's a madhouse in here today. He starts to hand you a menu, but just then you hear a rhythmic clapping start up in, in the kitchen. My god, squeals Bruce. I'm on! He snatches back the menu and runs off to join a stream of waiters who are pouring out of the kitchen. They uh, stop in front of another table and sing, Happy, happy birthday from cross keys into you. Happy, happy birthday. May all your dreams come true. Yay! The waiter fills file out and Bruce wanders off to serve another customer, forgetting all about you. Um, who's Howard Johnson? Nice place you've got here. Thanks, it's the first of a chain that I'm building. I duplicate keys. One day there'll be a Howard Johnson's on every turnpike on Taurus. Don't you think duplicating keys is somewhat one-dimensional business? Nonsense, everyone needs keys. Sure, we're off to a bit of a slow start, but we start serving drinks as a sideline to help keep us going until the core business takes off. Speaking of drinks, how can I get one? Just get a menu from Bruce, he'll be happy to take your order. Uh, have you noticed that Bruce acts a little funny? 
Oh, don't mind him. You know how odd these theatrical people are. Uh, Bruce floats by and says, Have I told you about a special's good? He wanders off again. Well, perhaps I'll have to come back there at some point. Oh, North was back in here. Uh, what does the sign say, actually? Examine sign. Howard Johnson's number one, cross key in. Keys made, drink served. After several moments, the waiter comes and stands in front of you. Hello, he says, my name is Bruce and I'll be your waiter today. I'll just give you a moment here to settle in and then I'll be right back to let you look at the menu. Blistershire Castle. This... I... That place was mentioned earlier in the game. Is this where one of the items we need to acquire is? You trudge along for a while and eventually the road comes to an end in front of a castle. The castle looks well nigh impenetrable. Soldiers patrol the parapet and the huge gate is shut tight. You see some iron rungs set into the wall near one corner next to a large prickly bush. Unfortunately, the rungs are situated directly below a pot of boiling pitch that is manned by an alert looking soldier. It looks as if others before you have laid siege to the castle. You see a battering ram, a large wooden rabbit, and a broken catapult here. The road leads back east of the tavern. One of the soldiers catches sight of you and says, These castles is the resting place of the crescent wrench of Armageddon. Vows must go away too sweet or we shall empty our noses in the air towards you. Oh, Voos. Vu. Vu must go away. Okay. That's in French for you. Batram, you have to drop everything you are carrying to even think about lifting one end of the battering ram. Soldier sneers and says, your father was the son of another man. Uh... Let's see, I came from the east, didn't I? So north is another direction. You start up the rungs, another soldier runs to join the first. They tip over the pot of flaming pitch. You leap to the ground just in time to avoid the fiery stream, but it strikes a bush below, hit, setting, it, uh, setting it afire instantly. A few of the clumps of berries fall clear, but then the fire quickly consumes the bush, revealing a hitherto hidden path around the castle to the northwest. Take berries. You take the berries. The soldier sneers at you and says, Your mother wears the boots of the army. Uh, northwest. You follow the path around the side of the castle. The wall here is just as well defended as the first one. You walk the length of it and turn the corner at the end and suddenly discover that the rear wall of the castle is missing. You walk right into the keep and tap the owner, of, owner on the shoulder. The castle keep is dominated by a large fortress-like central tower. The door is recessed into the wall of the inner tower just to your north. On the wall hangs a key on a chain below which is a bronze proclamation that has a large wax seal on it. A distinctive odour tells you that the stables lie to the east. A set of stairs lead south up to the parapet, and a path leads northwest back around to the front of the castle. The owner whirls around and says, Oh, figured that out, did you? We were hoping no one would discover our little secret until after we'd managed to build the fourth wall. That's why we put all the siege equipment out there, so people will waste all their time trying to break through the front door. Still, here you are, and I'm afraid you'll have to set the attack turtles on you. He blows a whistle, and all the soldiers leave their posts along the wall and retreat into the central tower. The owner drops some turtles on the ground and then goes into the tower and closes the door. Take key. You tug on the key, but it is uh, holding onto the chain tighter with... But it's holding onto the chain tighter than a two-year-old clings to its mother during the 4th of July fireworks. The turtle takes a menacing step towards you. Examine seal. It's a fancy wax seal that's been affixed to the proclamation. Take seal? The wax has been hardened onto the bronze. It doesn't seem to want to come off. Examine 
proclamation. It's a bronze plaque that reads, Hear ye, hear ye, be it known to one and all that this key unlocks the door to the inner tower of Blissister Castle. A touch to the bottom of the proclamation is a wax seal. The turtle fix you with an icy stare. different directions. The set of stairs leads itself up to the parapet. Hold, hold on. Uh, a distinctive odour tells you that the stables lie to the east. A set of stairs leads itself up the parapet and a path northwest back around to the front of the castle. And north presumably would be forward through the door which I can't go. Parapet. You're standing high on the parapet that used to be occupied by the castle's defenders. There's a pot of flaming pitch here. A flight of stairs winds back down into the keep to the north, and a set of iron rungs lead down to the south. So the only thing this has given me access, access to is the pitch. Your nose has led you unerringly to the stables. Inside you see the cart that nearly ran you over in front of the tavern. The two-headed oaf is still sitting inside, and the back of the cart is still loaded with wood from the enchanted forest. One of the branches looks like it could be one of the roots that tried to trip you on your way through the forest. The only way out of here is to the west. Are you left-brained or right-brained? Mind if I help myself to one of those branches? Um, uh, first an obscenity, and not only that, but go away. Uh, didn't you have to drive a test before you could uh, drive that cat? Sure, we only killed one self and painfully maimed another. Yeah, and that was only on the written portion. Do you happen to know Gretchen the Old and Wrinkled? Uh, sure, but she's our mum. Yeah, but she always liked you best. Did not. Did so. Did not. Well, maybe she didn't. Oh, of course we read about Gretchen um, in the newspaper in the starting area. Um, I've forgotten if it was the farm or in the um, castle section, the uh, King Fudd's castle. Anyway. Do you have two of anything else? I have nothing more to say to you. You're obviously confusing us with someone who gives a darn. Uh, uh, take branch. She flaps your hand away and Jake's head says, Naughty, naughty, mustn't touch. Those are tortoises. Turtles. The turtles don't appear to be interested. The turtles take a menacing step towards you. Uh, northwest. East. North. Hold on, didn't I have a coupon for acting lessons? I wonder if Bruce might be interested and that's how I get a menu. Give coupon to Bruce. Removing the coupon from the backpack first. Ah, that's where it went. Reese's eyes pop out of his head. He absentmindedly hands you a menu while he reads a coupon. I would kiss you, he says, but this isn't that kind of game. Uh, he stuffs the coupon into a private area of his clothing and moves on to help another customer. Your score has just gone up by five. A patron in one of the booths orders a mead light. Someone in the next booth says, I'll bet he ordered it because he has, it has less taste than regular mead. I think we've read this before. Uh, 
Uh, the drink arrives and the customer takes it. You're both wrong, he says, chewing off the, the top of the bottle. I order it because if I drink enough of the swill, I might get to meet the Swedish bikini team. He spits out some glass shards and drains the bottle, which then magically disappears. The other customers lapse into an uncomfortable silence. Examine menu. Mead, mead classic, mead dark, mead light, heavy mead, mead bull, diet mead, alcohol free mead, caffeine free mead, mead uh, spritzer, mead shooter, mead dry, mead genuine draft, mead florentine, smoky mountain mead, grog. That's the only thing on the menu which isn't mead. Certainly he disappears for a brief second and brings back the drink. Unfortunately the mug dissolves before you have a chance to drink the contents. That's a Monkey Island reference. How come I didn't have to pay for my drink? My dear man, after all you've done for me, I couldn't dream of charging you. Do you know the way to get into Blister Castle? No, but if you hum a few buzz, maybe I could pick it up. I can't have customers walking off with our menus, but if you ever return, I'll be sure to deliver one to you personally. Bye bye. Uh... Do I still have the book? And if I read it, will it put the turtles to sleep? Even glancing at the cover makes you drowsy. You dare not actually open the book. The turtles take a menacing step towards you. What about... To the oaf. Give book to oaf. Removing the book from the backpack first. The oaf shies away from you as if you had, as if you had the plague. Where have you been living? A coven? Everyone knows that uh, that book will put you to sleep in seconds. that way. Ah, if I could get one of those branches, I could set it on fire with the pitch, and then I could probably get the key by burning it. I'd still need some way to... Um... Get past the tortoises, though. What manual is that? Keys to success. Ah, okay. Although, since they make copies of keys here, I wonder if I need to have a copy of the key for some reason. The rodent are bright blue and about as big as the tip of your finger. Oh, so those are the ones that help you with your sense of direction, are they? 
neither a borrowing nor a lender be. Maybe I just need to order each of these and see what happens. Wow, that's strong stuff. Bruce says, certainly, he disappears for a brief second and brings back the drink. You attempt to open the bottle, but the cap seems to be stuck. Your score has just gone up by 10. It's a brown bottle with a sturdy looking cap. Oh, was that the one that they... that the patrons in the bar were talking about with the easy opening caps except they end up having to like break the glass with their teeth or something uh, I wonder if I give it to the oaf they'll get drunk or something Give the mead light to the oaf. Jake takes a long pull, followed by Elrod. Jake says, I love this stuff. It sure has less taste than regular mead. Elrod shakes his head and grunts. <coughs> Sorry. Elrod shakes his head and grunts, no. It's good because it's more filling. Less taste, more filling. The heads square off against each other, intent upon their argument. While, the atten while their attention is elsewhere, you manage to grab the branch. Okay, progress. Uh, what direction do I want to go? Is it south? Yes. Put branch in pitch. You did the branch in the flaming pitch. It immediately bursts into flame and becomes a quite serviceable torch. Wonderful. Okay. The key is hanging from a chain. Perhaps I need to melt the wax with the torch, then make an impression of the key, then go to the um, the key copiers and get a copy. You hold the torch just under the seal. It begins to soften and then melt in little drops. Until all that's left is a soft blob of wax on the ground. Uh, take wax. Put wax on key. You press the key into the wax and when you remove it you're left with a perfect impression of it.
Give blob of wax to Bruce. Um, talk to Bruce. Oh no. Give blob of wax to Howard Johnson. Johnston. Okay. Give blob of wax to Howard Johnston. <laughs> Give blob of wax to Howard Johnston. Now we're talking. Howard grabs the wax impression and leaps into action. Moments later, he hands you a shiny new key. Awfully good of him not to charge me. So I now have a way in, but I don't, haven't figured out how to get past the attack turtles yet. Do I need to? Put key in door. You're going to have to deal with those turtles before you can, uh, tortoises. You're going to have to deal with those tortoises before you can get anywhere near the tower door. game put on my shortlist for this phase. Burn, buy, drop, enter, examine, get, give, look, melt, open, pull, put, read, shoot, take, talk to, throw, tie, undo, wait, where. This seems a bit cruel. The turtles won't burn. The turtles take another step towards you. Okay, fair enough. also seems cruel. Removing the torties from the backpack first, you give the turtles a liberal dose of the torties. Oh, because it's a testudinal muscle relaxant. Testudinal as in turtle. Uh, from the Latin. The vial magically disappears and then one by one the turtles kneel over until all, until all you hear is the sound of little turtle snores. Okay. Open door. With the shiny key, you unlock the door and step inside. The door swings open, you cross your feel your way into the pitch black tower. Suddenly, all the lights come on, and a man in a red jacket comes running up to you. Congratulations, he shouts. You, Eric the Unready, have just been selected to play a brand new game show, Wheel of Torture. He takes you by the arm and leads you to a podium where you join another nervous looking contestant. Here's how we play. There will be four categories on the board, each with four Taurus related questions. One player will select a category, then you both have several seconds to answer the question. If you answer correctly, your score is increased by the value of the question, and you get to select again. If you answer incorrectly, your score will be decreased. After all 16 questions have been selected, whoever has the highest score will win his choice of one of five fabulous prizes. Show them what they're playing for, Don. Well, Alex, today's lucky winner you can choose from these fine gifts. First, there's the home edition of Wheel of Torture. Subject your loved ones to the same excruciating agony as our real-life contestants. Next, 
There's the collected comedy routines of Sir Jerry Lewis. We'll have hours of fun laugh along with that wacky nutty guy. Then it's the crescent wrench of Armageddon, with more than enough power to handle those little jobs around the house. Our fourth prize is the world's largest barrel of gunpowder. It is a lifetime supply! Great for practical jokers and serious insurrectionists alike. And finally, we have a set of Ginzu knives. Uh, because apparently... Sorry, I missed some of that. Um... I don't know what to pick, so I'll just pick the first one. The largest body on water the largest body of water on Taurus is the inner sea, the Gulf of Blefuscu, the Hounds at Bay. Uh the inner sea? That is correct. Well, I mean you'd expect a sea to be larger than a gulf or a bay. The law of amazing coincidences was discovered in the small province of coincidences by two people at the same time by accident. The law of diminishing returns was ratified by the disappearing parliament, isn't what it used to be, eventually slowed down and then stopped working altogether. Uh, no, that is incorrect. Eventually slow down and then stop working altogether. That is correct. The border between the side of Taurus and the other side is the Rim Mountains, the Fields of Dreams, the 39 Steps. Dear, I'm not doing too well, am I? The fastest way to Manta is through his stomach, his mouth, his breast bone with an axe. Famous sayings of Bjorn the Berserker. It's better to have loved and lost than to have loved and then been kicked in the face, to have loved and been discovered to have loved and been dismembered. When in Rome, loot and pillage, sack and burn, loot, pillage and sack, then burn. If you can't say something nice about someone, scream obscenities in his face, say something nice to his wife instead, cut his head off. Hot pori, I don't know what that is. Sish Boom Ba is the official cheer of the Taurus Bulls, what the audience does at melodrama, the noise a sheep makes before it explodes. Queen Morgana's favourite piece of music is the Nut Kraken Suite, the Barber Surgeon of Seville, the Foul Tempered cla uh, Clavier. Lucky guess. The airspeed of an unladen Garrafin Swallow is. Zero, it cannot fly. That is correct. Twice the square root of its hypothalamus. Um, the song most often sung by the singing sword is If I ever could cleave you, if I could have land I could have lanced all night as long as he wields me. 
If ever I would leave you. Lucky guess again. Unless this game is rigged in some way whereby all of them can be correct answers and the uh, developers uh, ensure the player always wins. The largest wooded area on Taurus is the Forest Fortress, the, the Enchanted Forest until yesterday, yeah. The Hera Commander Cops. The hole in the centre of Taurus was caused by a giant meteor, large hungry rats, the uh, centre punch of the gods. Another very lucky guess. I don't think he can win now. No, I don't think he could have won for a while looking at the scores. Legal. The law of selective gravity states that an object will fall so long as to do the most damage. When you're juggling items, the thing you drop will be the most valuable. You only stumble when someone important is watching you. Oh, that's incorrect. Now, if I get them incorrect, um, could he win? No. Uh, the law of inverse proportion states that only magical items can be bigger on the inside than on the outside. The closer you get to a dragon, the less you want to be there. The longer you try to fine-tune something, the more likely you are to break it. Lucky guess. Eric wins uh, 2,700 points to 700. Congratulations, Eric. Which of our fabulous prizes would you like? I'll take the Crescent Wrench, you stammer nervously. The Crescent Wrench it is, says your host. Show him how to use it, Don. Sure thing, Alex. He walks over to the prize area and picks up the wrench. Let's say you wanted to loosen the bracket that's holding this large torch saw. Just give it a twist like this. He yanks on the bracket and the torch falls onto the world's largest barrel of gunpowder. Run away! Run away! Uh, pandemonium breaks out as everyone races for the exit. You snatch up the wrench and are just clearing the door when you hear a low rumble followed by a very large boom. Finding oneself in freefall at several thousand feet can sometimes be disconcerting, what with the unfamiliar surroundings and the uncertain prospects for the immediate future. One tends to hold on to the familiar, which is exactly what you do when your backpack suddenly appears in the air next to you. Grabbing onto the packs uh, seems to slow your descent as you come in for landing over the pavilions of a fairground. You land on the roof of one of the large tents and bounce off the canvas like it was a huge trampoline. When you finally hit the ground, the impact knocks you out cold. Meanwhile, How nice to see you again, L'Oreal. I hope these past few days in the dungeon haven't discomforted you. It will take a lot more than bad food and a few rats to scare me, you evil hag. You better just kill me now before Sir Eric arrives and destroys you. Oh, we're not going to kill you, my dear. You're far too valuable for that. But I do have a little surprise for you. You're getting married! It'll be a simple wedding, just enough to ensure that you'll never be allowed to rule the kingdom. You're insane. I will never consent to be wed. Your consent won't be required, dear. The minister is a friend of mine. He's not exactly a stickler for formalities. The groom is quite a pleasant fellow too. I'm sure you'll, e you'll even come to love him if you can ever learn not to throw up in his presence. Guard, take L'Oreal to see our visitor. I'm sure she'd like to spend some quality time with her future husband. Ooh, baby, you look nice. What's your sign, sweet thing? 
I'll bet you've never had a real man. Take uh, take down that for sale sign, girl. You found a buyer. How about it, baby? You want to do the wild thing? Hurry, Sir Eric. Hurry! Entrance. Gaily dressed crowds of people stream past you into a meadow decorated with banners and pavilions. It is the St. Barkens Day Fair, around across Taurus as the liveliest festival in the land. The entrance to the fair is to the north, and the road uh, winds up into the hills to the west. Harold stands nearby reading a proclamation from a scroll. You see a newspaper here. Okie dokie, I think we're going to stop there for today. I should be streaming again tomorrow at 4 o'clock, British time as usual. Um, UK time. Uh, on Monday, I'm hoping to start the new Monkey Island game. That's the day when it comes out. Uh, I will also be streaming next Wednesday, which will be my normal poetry, prose and riddles. Uh, Friday will probably be continuing... Uh, Monkey Island, if it if I haven't finished it, which I imagine I won't in one session. Uh, so I suppose I'll have to try and finish Eric the Unready um, tomorrow if I can. If I can't, then I'll probably get back to it after I've finished Monkey Island, but before I've uh, get back to the next Mist game. Because that's one that I've been looking forward to doing. Still. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the stream. And I wish you all a wonderful night. Good night.